You're listening to Women's Cricket Chat with Hannah and Alex. Coming up on today's podcast, we've got the legendary Jenny Gunn. Now, for those of you who don't know, Jenny Gunn had a stellar 15-year career with England, winning the 2009 World Cup double and being a five-time Ashes winner. Now, Jenny talked to us about her upbringing and about how she probably thought she would have played football over cricket but then decided to play cricket and she talks about how lockdown has impacted her by helping her get stronger fitter and quicker obviously thank you for joining us how's things going at the moment and did i see you're working with is it trent college at the moment yeah so um tash farrant was working there last year and um she obviously is now playing for england um got the call up so um they were short of um, a coach a female coach and it's literally around the corner from where i live so ideal really and um it's good for me to get some experience in coaching and it's nice because schools that have have not always been in lockdown so it's it's given me a bit of freedom to get out and about and it was it was kind of nice I, I met the the head coach years ago when my, one of my best friends worked there so um sort of came across him before but it's it's really good and it's helping me learn a hell of a lot about um coaching really because is that something that you were always passionate about when you were playing for England and obviously you're still playing so is that something that you're looking post-career to do as full-time yeah it's it's strange because I never ever wanted to get into coaching um just kind of wanted to play cricket and never thought I would I would get into cricket coaching anyway I wanted to play I I love all, all sports so getting people involved in in activities that's what you want that's what I wanted to do but um I got the opportunity to do my level three a few years ago and actually that was probably the turning point where I thought okay I can do this I actually enjoyed it and you never stop learning and everyone coaches differently and everyone responds differently so that's what I'm learning at the moment how how to get your like the coaching points across to to people so like I'm coaching some girls bless them who've never played before and they're just come from a a tennis and hockey background who are amazing cricketers but don't know any any terminology like they don't know off stump and things so actually how you have to coach them it's it's completely different so it's all fun and games but I'm really enjoying it at the moment. Growing up, your father was a footballer for Nottingham Forest, won the European Cup. Did you ever have a sense of pressure to play football or was it always cricket you wanted to have a go at? It's strange because I wanted to play football for England. Um, so it's a bit bit strange. So I was I was football all growing up, but um, my whole family are very sporty and, and we were all, always encouraged to play any sport going. So I even tried ballet because my sister did it and I was dreadful at it. And I think my family just paid for the lessons for entertainment because I was that bad. I'm so clumsy. But my dad played football in the winter cricket summer. So we were always crossing the sports. And, and back then you could, like football season wasn't as long as it is now. So always wanted to play football, but my family have never ever, ever pressurised me into anything and I think like I remember when they used to come and watch me play football it was the saying is if in doubt kick it out but no my family are if in doubt knock it out but that's normally my grandma who um sort of says that who who is foreign and doesn't quite get the English terminology at times but they always came to support us and we used to win like 21 nil and, and things but no matter what they were always there to support me and yeah cricket was just kind of just happened a little bit more random really but I can't really complain with where it's taken me. Yeah, because you've mentioned to me before about your kind of cricket story. And I find it so interesting that you started your journey kind of at Trent Bridge, but never got to return until lightning back in was it 2019 the first time you got to play at Trent Bridge yeah proper cricket so I've always played quick cricket um, at Trent Bridge just in in school festivals and it's it's always your you dream isn't it to play at your home ground and the test ground as well so it was uh, playing quick cricket I thought it was still special but then my brother um, uncle and dad have all played proper cricket matches so they always um, give me stick for it until I got to play um, for lightning and it was such a special day because my whole family like we can all we can walk down to the ground so it was such a special day and to be fair that was probably the ideal time to retire um <laughs> then but yeah 2021 we're still playing so um I think my family just want um another season where they can come and watch and get out really and obviously 2020 was a horrible year for everyone due to the pandemic how did you cope and how did you keep your mind busy during those tough times it was a strange one for me because I was in Australia and I was sort of coaching out there. Didn't take any cricket kit with me. And then my club side, Sydney, said, um, OK, all the country girls are going home for Christmas. We're, we're short of some players. Can you play? I was like, oh, you've helped me out. So um, sent me on a bit of a guilt trip and I rocked up and I felt like I was 12 again. I had no kit, no whites, well, no colours. And I was 
people like saying who's this player so um yeah that, that was fun and um, borrowed Alyssa Healy's bat from her dad which is far too good a bat for me really but um from there that was it I played for the rest of the season and then with COVID sort of hitting it was it was sort of going on in in Australia and hearing a bit about lockdown and things and didn't hear much too too much over here but then my sister um caught COVID in March so I was planning on staying in Australia, but when when things like that happen, I thought no, need to be around family. So um, got the next flight possible to come home, and then literally got back on the weekend. And the Monday uh, lockdown happened in England, so didn't really get to see my family properly as 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 so many people haven't. But being away before then, it's it's quite strange, and and still haven't seen them for probably probably eighteen to twenty months now that I haven't properly seen them. So yeah, it's it's been a bit of a weird one, but I think I'm probably the fittest I've ever been from. Um, I joined Peloton so I've been biking quite a lot at home um, and playing for Northern Diamonds that's got me out um, a much much more because I've been out, allowed to go to Leeds so I'm up there three times a week so um, sometimes it doesn't feel like you're in lockdown which is quite a strange strange thing when a lot of people aren't allowed to go out so I'm quite fortunate to to be in a in a place where I am allowed to to do things so um, very lucky. I find it so weird at the moment because I've been back on campus this week and it's so strange. I'm like, there's people like, what is this? And seeing like the lightning girls are training and obviously I can't let go. So I went down and took some photos for them and it's just so strange. Yeah, Because we train at uh, Leeds Beckett Uni and each week it's slowly becoming more and more busy. And it's like first week it was like you didn't even think it was um, a uni. Whereas now you can you sense we're, we're getting closer to, to well, lockdown being lifted and hopefully getting back to normal. Yeah, because um, we've got to have tests every week as well to be on campus and stuff. So it definitely feels safer and it feels strange. But it is that glimpse of normality that I know so many people don't get. And yeah. obviously, as you as a player, like it is a privilege to be able to play. But it's also kind of your right as well. Like you should be training. You are an elite athlete. So how do you deal with obviously training during COVID? Yeah, it's, it's quite a strange one because first of all, I found it really difficult because I was driving like an hour and a half and it's like, well, should I be doing that? Even though I'm allowed to, it felt a bit odd. But yeah, I go up and it's kind of weird as well because we're, we're, we train for a team sport and sometimes I'm training on my own because a few of us like have niggles or some can't make it. So you're only in a, a bubble of four. So it's really weird because I haven't seen some of our players since the final in, in September. So it's going to be weird come April when literally we're going to have warm-up games and that's the first time we've seen the whole we're going to be as a full team so I think we're lucky that we're, we're we really gelled and bonded well as a team last year so I think everyone's just looking forward to to getting outside when we can have a few more people to be able to train with and I don't like having uh, Phoebe Gray and bowl at me indoors because um yeah it comes around my head a bit so um I'm excited to change groups and um and, and get a few more bowlers because I can't bowl one back at her so I don't think that's fair that isn't fair at all is it no it's, it's like you need a bowl of etiquette, don't you? Like you don't bowl one at someone, but she knows I can't bowl one back. So it's not fair, is it? No, 100%. And how have you found that team in that setup? Because obviously it was brand new last year. You did kind of get pushed into a squad without really knowing people, without that time to really train as a group like you normally would get. So tell us about all the dynamics that are forming and the team culture. Yeah, I think we were lucky. So um, myself, Lindsay... Beth Langston, um, Holly Armitage, Lindsay Smith, we were all in Australia together last year. So, um, um, yeah, it was quite weird going from Australia to, to Yorkshire. Um, and also, uh, Stair Callis was in Australia as well. So we played against her. Um, so there's, a, there's like kind of a group of us there. And then there's the Durham lot who obviously train together. So even though it wasn't clicky, but you had your groups anyway. So I think it made it a bit more easier when you came together because someone always knew each other. And actually, the, the youngsters just like... They've changed because when I was a kid, I didn't say a word for like five years. And now they're just cheeky little buggers. And I'm like, all right. Um, but actually, it's quite fun. And, and they still give me stick now. And, and I think that's part of it that they feel comfortable. Like they can take the mickey out of me. And and then it's not about respect or anything. I, they just I think it's just their way of dealing with it. And and yeah, I've got, got to be um, on my toes and things. And they've already keep going on about have I got vaccinated yet? I'm like, I'm not that old yet, but thank you. So, um, but yeah, it, it is really good balance and it's a shame we haven't been able to do more as a, as a whole team. But like I say, I think last year we made a, a massive effort. So this year, I think hopefully it'll be a lot easier. And like I said, we just can't wait to get that first session together again, which fingers crossed it, in a month's time, we'll be able to do it. You'd obviously retired and then unretired to come back and play. What was the driving force behind that to kick you back into playing? If I hadn't played club cricket in Sydney in the winter, I wouldn't have played. But uh, I'd been training 
like every week and was playing against some decent uh, players out there. So um, there's some Aussie players in, in our team as well and, and state players. So if I thought, OK, I can still hold my own. So if, if I hadn't have done that, I never would have come back. But also it was lockdown. It was either play cricket or be locked up in your four walls. So why not really? Why not try and play and actually really enjoyed it? And um, I think that's probably helped me even find the love of the game even more because once like England finished, it was it was probably quite difficult because in a way I felt like it wasn't on my terms, which you want to always finish on your your terms, have your last game, but you can't always have that fairy tale, can you? So it was a bit hard, but actually Northern Diamonds and Sydney Cricket Club made me find the love of the game, which I want to because I want to finish on that love of the game so I can feel confident in coaching and, and be happy where I've left my cricket game. So, yeah, I, I was quite um, happy when Danny Hazel said, come on, why don't you come back and play? And I'm very grateful that she gave me the opportunity. Because especially you're only, is it 34? Yes, thank you, not 38. I was going to say, yeah, that was Enid. Enid said 38 and I didn't have the heart to tell her that she was wrong. I know, I was going to say, but she's known me for years since I was a kid. So I don't know, 38 though, I'll take 36. But you are still young because she was playing until she was 42. As she, well, she's still playing until hopefully 80. So she says she's just waiting. She had her knee up or something. She's she's waiting for something she mentioned to us. But um, we're hopefully going to set her up with indoor cricket. So they've got an over 30s team. They need <laughs> players. And I was like, this is the perfect opportunity to get Enid her 80th year getting some cricket. But... She played for Clifton Village in Nottingham. She played, so that was my club as well. And she played second team cricket. And um, I went down I, and got roped into umpiring. I can't score because I get distracted talking, shock. Um, so I was umpiring. And she came on to bowl. And literally she got her arm up, turning everything. I was like, Enid, you've still got it. And this must be when she was 40 as well. And she was like running between the wickets. And do you know, like some kids are just like, Meh, whatever, I'm not bothered. And Enid was just running. I was like, how the hell can you not be running around, charging around when you've got Enid here, like still bowling? I love that because, like, I, I think people get so obsessed with, like, age, don't they? And they're so obsessed about young players coming through. But they kind of take for granted the perhaps more mature players who are still young. And they've still, still got plenty to give. Yeah, but I think now people are fitter. Like, it's not, it's your choice if you choose to stop. And like, I get your eyes going all this, but like I say, I probably feel fitter now than I ever have been. I've got quicker running. Like, I never thought that was possible at 34, but my technique was awful. And, and with the coaches up there in Yorkshire, they've I've got quicker. I was like, okay, why not? Why can't, why do you have to stop? So um, I'm excited by it. And and I don't, I don't want to stop. And it was just talking to my grandma the other week. She was like, I'm not ready. She's 82. She's like, I'm not ready to give up. I was like, yeah, that's what you want to hear. Like, you want to be walking around still. I want, to, want her to come to watch cricket. We've, like, she's got a great grandson who's six. She wants to go and watch him play cricket and, and football like she did us. And, and that's what I reckon gives me the up and go, that why give up? I'm 34. What's 34? It's like you say, it's, yeah, it's, you feel old when there's like these 16-year-olds, 17-year-olds coming in. But actually, I feel fine. That's what is brilliant with cricket because I think it is one of those sports where age doesn't matter. You can play until whatever age, because especially in village cricket, you see old blokes like, yeah. God knows how old, don't you? Like, yeah, so that's I think what you mean, though. <laughs> <laughs> I think it should be the same with women's though. Like, whatever <laughs> level, it doesn't matter whatever age you are. Just play cricket and enjoy it. Exactly, and I think I think that's what with Northern Diamonds as well. We've got a bit of an older an older side, but. Like I say everybody's still learning and, and it's so nice to see that they've been given that opportunity that like like Phoebe Graham for instance 29 like why should she not be given an opportunity just because like she hasn't had in the past but she's worked her ass off and deserves a chance so I'm just so excited that um, people are getting recognition now for all that hard work that's gone before. So you just mentioned Phoebe Graham then obviously with her like you mentioned like 29 giving up her job at Sky it is so brilliant to see isn't it like mm. And how important do you think having more experienced players are for Northern Diamonds? Because obviously we saw the final was obviously Vipers and yourself and Vipers were perhaps a much of a younger side. Whereas those in the middle ground, it felt like the players who did have younger sides, I think there was a stat somebody put out, they did struggle more in terms of getting the wins on the board. Whereas yourself was really consistent. 
Yeah, I, I think it, the final frustrated us because we were in a winning position and, and we felt we threw it away. Um, no, no disrespect to Vipers, they, they definitely turned upon a day and, and deserved to win how they played. But um, I think we've, we've took a lot from it. But I think it, it does help having that experience. And we are so lucky having Beth Langston as well and Lindsay Smith, Holly Ott, like all these people who've played, um, even England Academy, but higher up. So they know what, what it involves. And when the pressure's on, that's when you realise just actually having someone to try and keep calm and actually end of the day is just a game of cricket whereas a lot of our girls were worrying it's like but there's worse things that can happen like we're on the field with like your mates and stuff like it's just putting it all into into context that yeah you want to win and stuff but I am going to get hit for four I am going to get hit for a six that's cricket for you and, and you can't be perfect so actually thinking trying to just get the mental side of it actually keeping them like just down to earth which is I think harder sometimes than you actually think because people just overthink and I'm, I'm key for it I, I overthink and I'm my biggest enemy but actually I've got that experience and at my age I'm, I've learned that yeah good shot or yeah I didn't do that well and I can get over it a lot quicker rather than actually worrying about the last five balls of bold and putting more pressure on yourself you don't need that you just want to have fun and, and that's what we're trying to bring in um, with Northern Diamonds to to have fun and relax and that's probably when we play our best cricket. And do you think playing at the highest level for England and now playing for Northern Diamonds, when players are struggling, do you think having played at the top level, it helps you to give advice or to help steer them in the right direction? Yeah, and most of the time I don't know. I like, like Hannah knows, I like to talk. So um, I feel people just come and talk, even if they're not feeling down. I think it's just trying to relax people uh, the best we can on the pitch, even if it's just running past, past uh, people. But it's also, I think, a lot easier when... I don't coach Northern Diamonds, but it's a lot easier to help out when you're on the field rather than like uh, Danny Hazel and um, Courtney on the sidelines. It's very difficult to try and help out, whereas I think having a person who's been around a while, um, it's a lot easier to try and help out everybody on the field and and probably sometimes hopefully be one step ahead of a game and know what sort of is happening and, and things. And just a final kind of question around the diamonds. Who are the players that we should be like keeping an eye on? Who are those kind of rising stars through the ranks and those who are more experienced that have perhaps gone under our radar, but we should really be focusing on them? Yeah, we it's weird. So we got really excited. I think everybody's just all of a sudden hope wants to bat, and which is so good because I mean last year when in the lightning game we still had Katie Lovick at eleven and we were still like, no, she can bat. So it's it's exciting. I think everybody's found that belief that they can bat. So I'll be watching out for a, a lower order who wants to get up the order thinking they're all batter now. But it's it like I say it's exciting. But I'm really excited to see Amy Campbell, who's a left handed bat from Oh, where is she? Durham? She speaks like a Geordie. I don't know where she's from, but she's got to be from Durham. Was she Northumberland? She's way up north, but she's hard hitting and she picks a ball up better than most people I've seen. And I'm just excited to to see her actually. She could take sides apart. Like I hate bowling to her. I really want her to, to kick on this year and, and show everybody what she can do. Like we, we know what she can do, but we want everybody else to, to see it. So um, that's one really exciting prospect. You want more? <laughs> I was gonna say, yeah, just just one. Is that all you've got? Come on. <laughs> um, the thing is, you're gonna just get the whole team because I just I don't want to just <laughs> say one person because like you've got Katie Levick who's just a really smart leg spinner who she just goes from strength to strength. Um, like Phoebe Graham is is getting better. Um, she's getting a lot smarter, knowing what she wants to do and when and how to do it, how to bowl different um, to different batters. And I think that's really going to help her. Uh, having our assistant coach has really helped her um, figure out batters as well, how to try and get them out rather than just running into bowls. So I'm excited to see her bowl, like openly bowling Beth Langston from like having pace from both ends who both can bowl bouncers, both got smart slower balls and that pair up I'm really excited to, to see but then like you've got the spinners so you've got Levick and then you've got Lindsay Smith coming on as well so I'm hoping I don't have to bowl much because we've got so much bowling and good bowling at that so I am really excited to to see that. So you just mentioned a slower ball there as well which obviously leads us on to is it called the whiff? The whiff yeah. So tell us about that. Basically we're just having a like we're having a session where we play around with, with bowling and, and they're some of the best sessions because every, like again everyone's different and um I find I come this side of a ball so like a leg cutter was 
the easiest way for me to do something and just played around and the whiff was created so I don't really watch how I do it I don't really I know sort of how I do it but I don't like to overthink it because then it goes wrong and it's weird because I've only bowled probably two this winter so I probably should bowl uh, a few more but basically had the night Trev was just like she just says come on bowl the whiff and um which is fine when it's massive boundaries when it's short boundaries the whiff won't come out but yeah it's just basically taking as much pace off the ball as I can and making the batters have to hit long basically basically they did work but I hate bowling it hate it yeah no because I know know that you hate it because I've heard you say that before but talking about just like the slow ball as well one of the things I see online all the time is oh women's cricket's so slow they don't bowl it like and Glennie said to me the other day she was like well duh that's the point like we're trying to bowl slow because that's the whole point of trying to like get the batter out yeah I think I think that's the thing because we I mean we have got the power now where we can hit sixes and um some people just hit it out of the park for fun it's ridiculous but not everybody can so you have to be smarter and and that's where I think the slow balls are good like I said to you if, if it's massive square and straight I'm going to bowl slow why why do you want to put pace on the ball like we can only have four fielders out so that makes it as well harder because you're gonna have to telegraph where you're going to bowl it so straight away five third and fine up you know slow ball's coming annoying but again I bowl it they have to they have to try and hit it so um yeah we have to be as smart as we can with what we're given and yeah fair play to Glennie for saying it because it's the truth isn't it definitely you had a formidable 15 year career playing for England is there one match in particular that sticks out in your mind there's loads isn't there like forever the 2017 World Cup is going to be amazing because it was on it was at Lords, and for me, my whole family were there, and that that was massive because my sister hates cricket. So to get her to a game of cricket all day, that was pretty special, and to bring her son as well. So it was just, he was only young at the time, but that just it just makes it, doesn't it? When your whole um, like when friends and family can be there, so that was pretty special. But also, um, we won a test match at the Wacker, but we we won the test match at the Wacker, which it was like 43 degrees, where everybody's saying oh, the Poms aren't going to survive this this weather, not realizing not many. Australians like that heat whereas we've just come from winter we want the heat we want to play in that and um, to win it there outright was was a special moment. And how did you feel winning the 2017 World Cup on home soil? Well it would have been nice if I took the catch to win it but apart from from that it was no matter what happened I think it was just a really special day and I think like Rachel Hayho Flint's son ringing a bell I think it just started the day perfectly and we all just felt like she was with us that day and and to win it just made it even more special not just for us but for her as well which is it was such a shame that she couldn't be with us on that day but we were probably only playing that final at Laws because of Rachel and her team that how much work they did before to actually get women's cricket on the map and like I say who would have thought we'd have a sellout at Laws and to win it in 2017. We spoke to um, Beth the other day actually as well and I didn't realise that that sellout crowd was a sellout prior to the semi-final. It's crazy, isn't it? And that's, I think it just shows, it helps when England are still in the semi-final. But still, I think it helps because there's so many Indian fans. And I think regardless, like I say, I think there's more Indian fans than there were English at the final. But they just love cricket. And, and that's like, no matter what, it was going to be a special day. We will take you back in time a little bit more as well. But first, I just want to quickly ask about those players that you did mention. So Rachel Hayho Flints, the Enid Bakewells and players of the past who did do so much to put the game where it is today. I think one of the nice messages that when we spoke to Jane Powell, she said was like, we always wanted to leave the game in a better place than where it was before. Yeah. And I think that generational, right, we need to like push on the game. We need to do our bit. We need to keep moving it. But who out of all those kind of players that you've already name dropped but others as well did give you the greatest kind of influence in getting involved in the game I think I'm I'm very lucky with the era I've played that I've played with the current group but also played with some amazing players and and I remember going to the 93 World Cup final and that was just that was just amazing and and some of the, the girls who played in that game I ended up uh, being good friends with so Jane Smith or Kassar whatever people know like know her as she's like one of my best friends and played club cricket with her and she's probably had a massive influence on my career because she probably looked after me not only at club and county level playing for knots but she was in the wicket keeper when I first started so having someone to look up to who's actually a friend she probably helped me in them early days when I didn't quite know much about cricket knowing that I was any good to play for England so she's definitely one but we we were very lucky at knots so we had Joe Chamberlain and and Karen Smithies 
they all played for England. So I don't know what it is in the water in knots. We were very um, successful. So we had Kate Lowe, Nikki Shaw, Dawn Holden, and they, Lucy Pearson came and played um, at knots. So I've had all these England players when I was playing at a club. And so very, and Enid as well, like Nottinghamshire girl. So very, very lucky that like, I've been around them. But yeah, we went to the a dinner a couple of years ago and that was a very special moment. So it was everyone who had uh, played for England, uh, male, female, played disability, cricket, like everybody. So we were lucky that we, we were presented with a cap uh, when we made our debuts, whereas the people who've gone before never did. So we got the opportunity to present these oldies, bless them, with an with England cap with their um, test number on it or ODI number. And that was a really special moment because why should they be any different? They shouldn't, they should get all this. And hearing their stories, how they got a boat to Australia and, and the times they had, that that is really special. Like to go from having a boat to now you get to go on business class, it's just worlds apart. And and again, like you say, we're only get to do this, these things, like play cricket because they fought so hard in, in a, a men's world, man's world back then when, I mean, still people shouldn't people agree still think now women shouldn't be playing cricket but they fought a hell of a lot to get us on that that pitch even just play at Lords for that special moment so yeah a lot to be thankful for I think also people forget that the first ever World Cup was a women's cricket one not a men's one so I think as the men's game has been elevated they forget that it actually started with the women and just going back to your debut you made your debut in 2004 against South Africa at the age of 17 what was it like making your debut so young I still remember going, I was on the way to college and got a phone call saying um, I'd been picked to go on tour. Would you like to come to South Africa? Thought it was a joke. Didn't really, didn't really think I was I was anywhere near playing for England. But um, I think it was Laura Sprague got injured. So they needed someone to be replaced. Yeah, why would you not? 17, I'm at college. I don't want to go to college. I want to go um, away. So I just thought, yeah, be running drinks. Uh, but it'd be a really good experience. And a week, week, two weeks later, I'm at the top of my mark opening the bowling for England. So um, yeah, it was it was a bit strange, but um, like it was just a very special day. And it's a shame, like it's hard when your family can't be there for that special moment. But um, it's one that I'll always always remember. And I read somewhere that your debut didn't perhaps go to plan the way you thought it would. Apparently, your bowling action being reported as illegal or something. Yeah. Like that. that was the start of my trucking days <laughs> um, how, how did it make you feel being called into the umpire's room to be told that on your debut yeah so I remember Claire Connor who's, who was my captain just said Jen can you come here I was like, oh. like she was a school teacher so it's like what it's like thought I'd be naughty I thought I've done nothing wrong surely and uh, went into the umpire's room and they said we don't think your your action's legal I was like oh great I've only played one game so um yeah it was a bit of a it kind of I mean we lost a game as well but it was kind of it was, I was still on sort of a high from making my debut but I just sort of got deflated because I didn't know I knew I had an ugly action uh, but I didn't know it was a dodgy one so that's when um the hard sort of like work came in like they tried to sort of change my action and it just wouldn't, I just couldn't change it. It was still like, I used to go up and down a wall so I, my arm couldn't come out and it had to come down. But then when the wall wasn't there, it just still went out because I've done it so many times. And then got tested, um, it was just ECB then, so got tested and actually found only, it was only seven degrees, so 15 and over is illegal, is illegal and mine was seven. So it's just a horrible action. And so I, I carried on bowling until... Um, I can't remember what was next, but I got, I've been called chucker constantly since then, probably from a lot in the crowd, but I've been tested by the ICC now, nowhere near, but then still, I still got banned from um, Australian state cricket in 09, just before the World Cup, which I think they were playing mind games. Um, Looking back now, it was just all a bit of dodge. Tell us a little bit more about that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I was waiting, I was like, oh, do I carry on? Yeah, carry on, carry on. <laughs> so um, I got called, so I was playing state cricket and yeah, they just said, it was the last game and then I got, they just said, oh, you need to go for testing in Canberra at the AIS. I was like, oh, okay, fine, whatever. So I rocked up and uh, they said, you bowl 100 Ks an hour, so six miles an hour, like slow. This is the thing, I don't even get those wickets, so it's really not that worrying, is it, for people? But I remember rocking up and I was, I was a bit scared because I was in another country as well. 
and they said I had to run in from outdoors so I was on concrete through some fire doors into this netting thing they said right you need to bowl six Yorkers hard work thank you six normal balls and six bouncers never bowled one why the hell I'm going to bowl a bouncer I have no idea my action is going to be dreadful so anyway bowled bowled them and they said your action's illegal I'm like well, it's not, is it? But it says, yes, it is. Right, OK. And it basically didn't take off my natural bend. Stupid. So um, this is the Australian Institute of Sport as well. So it's just a bit crazy. But the ruling is if you... So I could I could bowl in the World Cup in official games. If it, In a warm-up game, if I got called by the umpire, I was out for the entire World Cup. So rock up to the first warm-up game. The two umpires who called me in state cricket are our umpires. I'm like, you're just joking me. So just to be safe, we didn't. I didn't bowl in the game, and then I could bowl in the entire World Cup. So winning that World Cup in 09 made it a bit a bit sweeter. But I still remember a guy gave me his card at that testing day, and then he claimed he wasn't there. I was like, well, how have I got your business card? Like it was just there's just too many things that just did not make sense. But I mean, now I can bowl; it's fine. And yeah, it's just a dodgy action. And and I've been retested in Perth since that time. And some of the umpires who always thought it was a bit dodgy came to the testing and they said I'm so sorry for all them years I thought you tripped it like you just from different from certain angles it looks horrible it looks disgusting I know that and it makes me feel sick how much my elbow hyper extends in slow-mo but to hear them say I'm sorry it just made it a bit it made it easier for me because some umpires don't want to look at the footage of my action in slow-mo there's a Loughborough Uni wrote a journal on, on my action which is all figures don't understand it but there's data out there just on my bowling action it is crazy because I'm not even like I'm just an average bowler. <laughs> but it's it, it, the average thing though, because you're not an average bowler. You played for England and you've taken so many wickets and stuff. So stop with this average business. No, but, but you, if I bowled ninety miles an hour, I could understand. But I don't, <laughs> and it's like, why? It's just, it's just crazy that all that has happened. I mean, I got a free flight to Australia out of it, so that was a bonus. But it is just. It, it just crazy it's crazy and, and I say still people think I chuck it and I get called chucky and I, I'm I'm not bothered I'm over it now and I probably get a bit lost if someone doesn't moan about my action at least once a once a season so I'm not I'm, I feel my action must be I'm not doing it right if I don't get called a, a chucky so so if somebody came up to you and said oh you've got a beautiful action you'd be like oh my, well, who are you watching <laughs> <laughs> not me <laughs> Because like so, when I first heard that you were going to join Lightning, because I was not going to lie, I was absolutely bricking it because I was like, oh my god, it's Jenny Gunn, kind of thing, obviously. And I remember, I think we were down in Taunton, and you was like sat on my table for dinner, and I was like, do I talk to her about her action or not? Do I? Don't I? Because it's something that I struggled with because that's why I stopped playing as a kid and stuff because people are always saying, oh, you throw it, and I'm like, it's been filmed, it's been checked, it's absolutely fine. But I do think with my elbow and stuff and I don't know what I do but, but I it ruined it yeah and I think that's helped me as I mean I was lucky that I got so much support um from Knotts Academy and ECB and, and in, in the end ICC so um I was lucky I was in that pathway at the time um whereas I was in Sydney last year and one young kid bless her and young just got told no you chuck it you need to stop and it's like well no don't stop let's have a look and it was just jerky and stuff and and it's it's hard school over there if they just like sort of said no whereas they worked with it and, and she's come back and one of the older girls as well she's got a, an action it's like watching myself bowl but it's a bit more elegant than mine but we just we call each other chuckies together now we're like it like I think it's just how you deal with it and I think having been through it myself I can talk to people and because there's so many people who get everybody's different and everyone gets like thrown under the bus at, at sometimes when they're when they're chucking it but they don't like it's just when it's different people don't know what to do and I think that's why it was so good going to India and seeing like these kids just it doesn't matter if they're different like Bumra, like you're gonna tell him to stop bowling Malinga you're gonna say no it's like they're very successful people but let them do it unless it's going to cause an injury or like the odd person will throw it then work needs to be done but they just let them go let they're successful they can do it yeah because I remember and I've told Alex this before as well I was 17 playing at Malvern Festival which is going to be fun isn't it you know I'm sure yeah. you've played there or whatever back in the day and there was a coach from a different county a county that we never used to play because obviously when you're younger playing the county system you always play the same kind of team don't you so you know everybody or whatever and he just started recording me <laughs> and I was like 17 years old and I got so upset because I had a really like it was a really nice game it's coming to the end of under 17s and stuff felt really happy got loads of wickets whatever loving life 
and then to see he was doing that just destroyed me and I literally I hated it I was just like I'm never ever gonna play cricket again like I'm so done with this this is all the time and that was that like next level it would be different if it's say if it's your coach saying oh can I just take some footage to get sent there's, there's ways around it if he was going to help you and maybe talk to you first and say oh can I just get some footage I know someone and we can have a look but it's just how they do things it's when like I played in India I was in the newspaper saying I took it I was like like hello I was like thanks and it's just it's just like there have been some really good people who helped me through it and like I say I'm very grateful and now I can hopefully pass on that experience um because you don't want people to go through it because it is it's it's horrible especially when like at the time I was I was a bowler I couldn't bat I couldn't hit the ball off the square so then it was like oh I'm not going to play for England again because I can't bowl what I'm going to do I can't just find bowl for, um, can't feel that fine leg to fine leg for the entire game so yeah there's definitely ways around it and I think that's how I want to try and get into my coaching be um like just help wherever I can yeah no I love that because yeah I was always too scared to ask you at lightning because I was like oh my god it's Jenny Gunn and then obviously you know you get more confident when you realize that you are just real people like <laughs> yeah, and normal <laughs> yeah, it is though isn't it because it's so like I don't know it's, it's it's so strange when you actually do get to go in that elite performance moment and you're like, oh, yeah, they're just people. Like, yeah. Yeah. Just, just Alex is shaking her head at me now. Like, <laughs> Oh, it's fine. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you just started talking there, didn't you, on the table? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't just, you know, I wasn't just like, oh, my God. <laughs> I think you, you spoke to me and I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> no. yeah, I'm not mean. I'm not going to just sit in silence. <laughs> uh, but that's what I think I love the most about working within women's sport as well, is people are so down to earth and are lovely and genuinely do just care about one another. But I'll pass it over to Alex for a question before she tells me off for being too cringe. <laughs> you should definitely not call yourself an average bowler because you have 136 ODI wickets, which is the second most... Um, for an England woman only just behind Catherine Brunt so never call yourself <laughs> average but I had the title of um, leading wicket taker for, for a short time but I was so happy that I was there at Grace Road when Catherine beat me well took over me and she was always going to do it and it was so special for me to because I played my first ever game with Catherine to be there and experience it I think that just made it special as well definitely and you mentioned a little bit earlier about coaching and I read somewhere that you were one of the inaugural Chance to Shine coaching ambassadors. So I wanted to know, could you tell us a little bit about your role within Chance to Shine and what it entails? Yeah, Chance to Shine was um, a massive part to allow, I think, us to become professional cricketers as well. So back in the day, there was quite a few of us who worked for Chance to Shine. So we worked four days a week going into schools. Um, we just wanted to get um, cricket back into state schools, really, because it was mainly rounders. So um just wanted to get cricket back in the curriculum really so uh, a lot going into primary schools and just it was a lot of fun really and um, I had some of my best times actually in um, one of the special schools around the corner from um, where I am now and and it was just they they taught me a hell of a lot more than I, I could ever teach them and and that's probably again made me stay in love with cricket seeing kids play cricket and the faces that when they can when you can see them improving week on week out and that, that's what you wanted to see and going to festivals in the summer is, is what it's all about and actually now I think rounders has gone from the curriculum and, and a lot is is cricket which was one of the goals and there's a lot more people um, a lot more kids out there playing cricket and chance to shine coached a millionth I'm sure it was girl um, a few years ago uh, now so um, I think the next stage is they want the, the first chance to shine uh, kid to come through and play for England which um, will be the next target which is going to happen at some point um, and hopefully soon. I just got a feeling Nancy Harmon came through chance to shine. Oh, I, I played with her. Oh. Yeah I was just thinking I'm pretty sure she came through chance to shine I'm pretty sure I read that. I mean it's so hard so when I played at Warwickshire each week they came one of the players came in oh look at this picture and they're literally down here and I'm up here because I'm an adult and I was like oh, okay who's going to come in next then it's just so embarrassing so I tried to think how many like kids have actually coached I mean it's good because they're playing cricket still but yeah it's it's going to be really interesting to see who that first person is going to be. I mean if you do want to feel old I actually have got a photo of I think I was 10 and there's you giving us medals at a Lord Tavner's competition. <laughs> It is so embarrassing how many, honestly, it is, it is so like, because I mean, in some of England stuff, I'm quite young as well. So then you think everybody else is so young and it's just like, 
oh my it's, it's actually entertaining as well because seeing like you don't realize how many things you actually do at the time but it's actually quite cool to see like I'm friends with a lot of these people now who who have had pictures with as, as children it, it is it's I think there's one with Holly Armitage and Lindsay Smith so they always come out every every year it's like thank you for making me feel old <laughs> It is brilliant, though, all of that work that you did do. And thinking about 2009, we didn't really go into it too much. So tell us a little bit more about that year. Was it a triple winning year? It was obviously mad times for England. Yeah, it was it was crazy, really. So, I mean, after 2005, winning the Ashes, that was that was pretty special. But I think cricket got on the map. But I think 2009 is when we really kicked kicked things up a gear. Obviously, winning in Australia is massive. I think just any any win in Australia is is, is big, but winning a World Cup um, in their backyard that, that's something that we'll always remember. And obviously, winning that Lords um, the twenty twenty final. I mean, I took Catherine Brunt out earlier on in the in the competition, gave her a black eye. There's a few times I've hit her in the head, which is so bad because we actually get on. But yeah, taking your your mean fast bowler out, uh, giving her a black eye, I think it made her a bit more fierce um, in the final. Um, and she she just had the I think game of her life and and took New Zealand to pieces and and so that that was again that was really special. And then um, the Ashes, so we I think we held everything, which I say it it made people think about women's cricket a bit more seriously that yeah we can play cricket we're winning and, and I think that's the hardest thing is when you do win you you need to keep winning to otherwise people if you go up a boil people forget about you quite quickly and I guess I think I don't want Covid to it's a shame because of a World Cup last year in Australia that there was a ridiculous amount at the MCG and, and it kind of diluted a little bit because we couldn't have had a we didn't have a proper summer over here which is, is a massive shame so um, I think the, the quicker we can get back playing cricket hopefully the better for, for women's cricket. You've got a picture of Lords on your wall. Could you just explain to our... That's a 2009 final. <laughs> Could you explain to our listeners about the final and what it felt to play? And I mean, I was lucky to play at Lords before, but never in a final. So it's, it's just always a special day to play at Lords. And it was before the men's final as well. So you think, oh, who's going to come and watch us before? Because... That was that's the hardest thing playing before the men. That if your friends and family want to come and watch you, they have to pay more money because they have to get a men's ticket as well. But to see people actually lining up before you've even got on the, the ground to warm up, that made it special as well. And it, it felt like okay, people actually do want they are interested in in what we're doing. But it was it's it's always gonna be nerve wracking and and in 2020 it comes and goes so quickly. But you just gotta try and enjoy the occasion because you, you don't know when you're gonna play in a, another final again, especially at Lords in England. So it was a very special day and um yeah it was it was actually quite enjoyable because Catherine Brunt she ripped through the the order and um I was lucky enough to be at the at the crease when um Claire Taylor hit the winning run so um yeah a bit of a, a special moment when you hear the crowd sort of just celebrate with you it, yeah it's, it's one I say we'll always remember and someone uh, painted 500 of these and it now lives here so um yeah it's um something that I can just walk although I'm sure it was raining that day I can't remember it being that nice weather but I think it makes it look better and you mentioned about double headers there because I've seen on Twitter this morning there's already been some discussions about the 100 and obviously the aim of it is for like equality for both men and women but with double headers for women at, at the moment are positioned to go first and then the men afterwards. So what's your thoughts on them both positive and negative and did you enjoy playing within the double headers? I think at the start it, it was a way to get crowds in and actually show people we can play cricket. So even like people would come in like probably an hour, an hour and a half before our our games. They even just catching the end of it. I think we managed to capture a few more fans and people who actually thought women's cricket can we can play. But now I don't I think I don't think we necessarily need them as such. But I guess a hundred, it's a new competition. Who knows what's going to happen? It's probably the right thing to do right now. Uh, and it allows us to play on on the big grounds which we probably wouldn't get to do so it's given a lot of people experience that playing the, at these massive grounds and test grounds as well so I think right now for women's cricket the more people who get to experience that the, the better it's going to be in the long run for for England really. Because just thinking I put a tweet out earlier because with Lightning on one side when you were at Trent Bridge it felt amazing to me I don't know what it was like from your like player perspective but they genuinely cared about you guys and from the start the marketing was it's a double header and it was very kind of equal and it was always making noise about look the women are going to be here this is like the first time like we're opening our doors to lightning and making so much noise getting almost 5,000 people in that to yeah. me felt really special 
And I think that's the thing, like, as well, you're not going to, well, you might do one day, but Trent Bridge is massive. Are you going to feel that for just a, a league game? You might not, but I know growing up at Trent Bridge, it's a very family oriented club. We used to go down and play on the sidelines with other kids. And, and I think that family atmosphere, I really got that vibe, like you said, when we played for Lightning. So I think the 100, I think the 100 will be the same. And it's already got the buzz around it and flying around the social media. It's probably the most social media I've seen for women's cricket. So it's it's exciting. And, and like I say, it's, it's new to everyone no one knows what it's going to be like so I think we have to play them double headers definitely even if it's just for one year just to see how how it runs and then on the flip side as well with lightning I know we were at another ground which I won't name but <laughs> changing rooms on the other side of the pitch I know you lot were like trying to faff around get your stuff and like but then so far away to get down so you had to take your stuff down onto the pitch side and for me there was like no media box open so I'm like there we're in this random kind of corridor trying to look at the match and trying to do stuff and it was a very different treatment and on the ticket you weren't even mentioned on the ticket. It was a small writing, please note, this match also contains the women's match. So yeah. I was screaming. And, that, and that's the thing, like you, because also we're going to plug their ground as well, like on social media. So it's like, well, we're doing work for you guys. We want something back in return. And in a way, it's happened in the years, even for England. It's like, how have we not even got on that ticket? Like, because so many people says, oh, if we'd known there was a women's match, we'd have come and watched. It's like, how can you not, like, just even put it on a ticket? Like, it's not much more work, is it, to just put that on? Like, even if you don't post it out everywhere else. Just, so it is, it can be frustrating. And ho- hopefully, I think the 100 will help because it's another women's competition. And like I said, the marketing is so much better already. And obviously with Beth, <laughs> Beth involved, I don't think they've got a choice. Definitely. I think sometimes marketing is the key to things like this. You've obviously seen a lot of changes over your career. What have been the biggest changes that you've had to adapt to? I think the massive one's going to be the fitness side of it, because I think fitness is everything in cricket people just think you stand in the field all day and don't really do anything but you're easily like you run up to 10k in a game and so like in the gym people are hitting further because they're getting stronger they're staying on the part longer because they're fitter more robust bowlers are rolling quicker I think it just stems from the, the S&C work that everybody's put in and it's all the the horrible work you have to do with when no one sees and that it is challenging at times well, especially in winter it's my first winter back in years where I've had to train indoors and yeah it's, it's horrible and hard at times but you do all that hard work so you can actually get on the field in the summer and, and play the, the game you want to play. Just thinking about obviously the growth of the domestic game as well so how important do you think things were like Super 4s and then KSLs and regionals I mean Super 4s wasn't even domestic was it that was just I don't know what do you class it as Super 4s I had so much fun because I was a kid back then as well and, and getting to play with some amazing players but it, it was such a shame it ended because I think there was a place for it but yeah I think that the, the biggest one for me was KSL like I thought it was going strength to strength like you were getting the big overseas players people were starting to probably find their teams like supporters I felt at Lightning we really had a fan base and it was just getting even more exciting and so it was really annoying when they cancelled it and I know the 100 is probably going to be big but it was such a shame and I think that really helped kick on it allowed a lot of the youngsters to come in and put some of them on the map really and and so it was exciting times and I think that's where the Rachel Hoflin trophy it was I mean it's been going for one year but that's helped as well but KSL like all England players managed to play in it and it was such a strong tournament so yeah it's a massive shame but hopefully uh, Rachel Hoflin trophy that the England players can play in some games again and and these people like the youngsters can they can see what it takes to play for England and like it must be amazing like I think when one got Nat Siver out last year it's amazing because it's ridiculous like, I'd love to get her out let alone being a kid and getting her out but yeah it's it's a shame KSL was my favourite so um, it's always going to be something that uh, I was gutted that it it finished but I think Ray, Rachel Hoflint's it's going to go stronger each year I think yeah, because with the KSL, like you mentioned, so people like Kirsty Gordon got call up in the 2018 World Cup, Lindsay Smith, Sophia Dunkley, Glennie for a start. So Sarah Glenn obviously has now become an England regular, I think probably off the back of the KSL. So yeah, and it is, it's and at least like a few of them did. But then also like last year, it was Tash Farrant got called up from having a, a strong tournament. So I think going forward, these tournaments are helping people who 
I mean, Tash is a bit different because Tash had played for England, but it's given people the opportunity. If they're in form, there's nothing stopping you getting in, getting in the England team now, which is it's what you want because I think in the past, players in form haven't necessarily got picked. And it's like, well, why? Why do you not want the players in form to play for your country? And I think playing um, the strongest like domestic level we can, and that's where I think the 100 is going to um, go as well, take it to the next level, playing on the best grounds possible. I think we're going to have an even stronger England outfit in the next few years. Especially what you just mentioned as well, because so many people have said about the grounds making such a difference. So yeah. what difference has that made to you personally? Yeah, it's as a bowler, you know, you can't just bowl. You can't just put it up there. You have to um, hit your length every ball because even the batters have got even even better. So, you know, you can't over pitch because, you know, it's going to go for four. So which you get around on some of the outgrounds or some of the crappy grounds we used to play at whereas now proper covers proper decks better outfields I think it, you probably have to be even smarter as a bowler get your field placements right and it is just who goes for less runs a lot of the time just because like I say cricket is just going from strength to strength and yeah you get found out a hell of a lot quicker which is a nightmare but who'd be a bowler I don't know I just like I can bat a little bit more nowadays but yeah it's all about being smart and during your England career, you played with an array of top quality players. What was it like being vice captain to the legendary Charlotte Edwards? Vice captain was all right. It was when she got injured or ill and she said, can you captain? I was like, oh my gosh, I can't believe I've got a captain after um, Charlotte Edwards. But yeah, she was a ridiculous cricketer and she's an amazing coach. So um, you learn a lot from her and I was lucky enough to play uh, many years under her captaincy. So yeah, she. I think she'll be an ever England great, won't she? Surely she'll be a dame one day. But I think Heather Knight is probably, I'd have been proving myself a lot more if I was her because it's like you've got to follow in her footsteps. Whereas the vice captain was fine, you just sort of sit back and let her do it so and just hope she doesn't go off the field at any point. And finally, you and Enid both have something in common. You both have MBEs. What was it like to receive your MBE? Well, it was weird going to the palace because all these people had like cured cancer and all this and I'm there for cricket, which was a bit weird. But they just loved sport and things and, and it was really nice talking to these people. And I was more nervous when I got the letter because I was like, well, who do you take? Because there's so many people in my family who have helped me get to where, I, where I've been. And when I got three, I could take three people. It was it. I was took mum, dad and my grandma. But literally you drove into Buckingham Palace and um, it was a very long day, but a special day. But on the way out, my grandma rolled down the window and started waving like the queen. And we call her the queen though. And so, so she's our queen, but bless them, all these Chinese people, tourists are just taking pictures. And I was like, grandma, you're personating the queen. You're going to get arrested and stuff. But to her, it just made her day and it made it more special. And I'm so glad that she could be there for it. Well, Hannah, have you met my grandma? I, I, I'm trying to think. I think I must have seen her. But you I don't think... Every lightning game, she's tiny. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Mm. But to say she's foreign, she, sp- she speaks the Queen's English, so she had to learn English, and she's like, she says grass and glass. I'm like, who? No one in our family says that. So she is like the Queen, and honestly, she had, especially because she had to have a hat on. And I was just like, Grandma, please no. I love that, though. I love that. And just to round up from me, what are your hopes going into 2021 now? What What's left for you to kind of achieve? Right, so 2021 would like to try and get to the final again and win it this year, Rachel Hale Flint Trophy. But that's my main goal is to, we want to get to the final again and, and just go one step further, really. I haven't really thought about much more. That's a perfect answer to end with, to be honest. Um, we have got just a 60 second quick fire question round. Yeah, Alex or Devo's, and then you can escape. But thank you so much for spending a little bit of extra time as well. It's just the conversations were going to such nice places. I was like, this would be really nice. Uh, you know, I can talk. So these questions are just quite fun. They're not like serious. And if you do take a look at the time, I can just edit it down so that it's quicker. Favourite genre of music? R&B. Favourite artist? Can it be a group? Yeah, any. 112. Favourite wicket you've taken? Oh, Elise Perry, Dan Legside, thanks Sarah Taylor. Ashes, thanks. Favourite place you've played? I can't say it, Dallas, Dallas Sharma. Oh, yeah. I know. background. I know what you mean. Put it that way, I'll say it right, maybe. Dora Masala. Yeah, that sounds better than I said it. The last book you read? Oh, I don't read books. A vegan food recipe book. The last TV show you binge watched? Oh, great question. It'll be some murder documentary. That sounds, makes me sound like a psycho. I can't remember what. Uh, Line of Duty. This one's Hannah's favourite, but favourite sledge. I probably can't say it. Um, as in what I've heard. What you've heard or what you say. I don't and know. Then, 
And, and then I'll let Hannah reveal her favourite one. My wickets get caught in a boundary. I can't sledge when someone's smashing me. Yeah, I, I haven't actually got a sledge. All right, the one that, you, that you've heard, then, that was a very media trained answer. Like, oh, no, I don't sledge. But... I don't sledge, thank you. I'm a nice person. <laughs> um, that is a really hard question to answer off the cuff, I feel. I think I just used to chat a load of rubbish, to be honest. Cause, What's yours? Well, no, because my favourite one's just like, Big Swing No Ding, because that's a classic, isn't it? <laughs> Is that like Thunder Bales to Wales? Yeah, all of those. I love them. <laughs> we had one from Roberta who plays for Brazil, the captain of Brazil cricket and stuff. Definitely like to speak to her so you can go on tour to Brazil, by the way. They've got a whole cricket house and everything. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, but hers was like so many dots, like a Dalmatian or something. And I was like... Yeah, um, yeah I'm used to the ones that the Aussies say where it's probably like very, a lot of swearing. Favourite teammate? Now, currently... We have one current, one past. Okay, currently Lindsay Smith and past uh, Lydia Greenway. Oh, can I say Lydia Greenway? I think Isha Gilbert because I think, oh, I'm Beth Morgan. That's really hard. Best player you've played with? Nat Siver. And the best player you've played against? Nat Siver. Am I allowed to say Nat Siver for both? Yeah. Might be Meg Lanning and Lise Perry as well, but Nat Siver. Anna, have you got any questions? I was just about to say, I think that's probably, but uh, to be fair, now all I want to do is get your nan on it, your grandma. Oh, my God, yeah. Now, grandma would come on, wouldn't she, Mum? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need to make that happen in the future. That'd oh. be great. Well, thank you so much as well for sparing some time to chat to us because I've absolutely loved it. Um, <laughs> hopefully it's not been too painful because I know you're not a fan of media, so... Yeah, but this is sort of all right when I know yeah. mostly the answers because it's about myself. Massive thank you to Jenny for coming on and being a guest on the podcast. It was really great to hear her stories and about her time playing cricket for England and her cricket at Knotts and Loughborough and everywhere really. And if you wanted to follow Jenny on social media, she is at Gun Jenny on Twitter and she is at Jenny Gun 99 on Instagram. And to all our listeners, if you want to keep up to date with everything we're doing, you can follow us on Twitter at WCricketChat and on Instagram at Women's Cricket Chat. And if you want to give us a like on Facebook, we are Women's Cricket Chat. And if you wanted to give our personal Twitters a follow, Hannah is at HannahT1194 and I'm at AlexJanePerrera. This has been Women's Cricket Chat. Tune in next time.